San Francisco, September 2, 1925. Fifteen hours after the last word had been received from the missing seaplane, the PN-9, number one, which failed on its San Francisco to Honolulu nonstop flight because of a shortage of fuel, Captain Moses, commander of the flight project, was without word as to the fate of the plane and its crew. Maintaining the optimism he has felt since the giant seaplane bearing Commander Rogers and his four valiant flyers was reported missing, Captain Moses expressed the belief that the aircraft and its personnel would be found soon after daybreak. Last word from the plane was at 4.12 yesterday afternoon when it was given compass bearings. It was then believed to be about 150 miles from the Isle of Maui. Three naval seaplanes took off from Lahaina Roadsteads at the first precipice break of today's dawn and flew towards the eastern portion in a determined effort to learn the fate of the missing seaplane, PN-9 number 1. Conditions for the search were greatly improved over those of last night when rain and rough seas made survival doubtful of the five airmen who on Monday started on a scheduled non-stop flight from San Francisco to Honolulu. The first message received here from the three seaplanes today said clearing weather permitted them an unobstructed view for miles and that the ocean had calmed down. There was no visible trace, however, of the missing seaplane. With today's searching seaplanes, Navy officials assigned half a dozen submarines, several destroyers and other craft, which steamed out to the east in fan formation. Officials continued in the belief that the missing aviators would be rescued. Throughout the night, three destroyers engaged in a systematic search of the area in which the seaplane was believed forced down. They steamed in gradually expanding circles until a hundred miles had been navigated, playing their powerful searchlights to either side, but without finding the object of their search. A message received from the destroyer Aristook at 10.15 last night said, no trace of plane number one, which was forced down over 20 miles south of the Aristook station, where the estimated maximum drift is 8 miles an hour to the westward. The seas are moderate and the sky is overcast. With the destroyer Farragut, the Aristook spent the night moving in the area 500 miles off Honolulu, stabbing the seas in the vicinity where the missing plane might have dropped disabled. A message received from the missing plane after the craft radioed that it was trying to remain in the air until the dwindling gasoline supply was exhausted said, What is wrong please, go ahead, meaning that the Aristook should proceed with furnishing compass bearings to the PN-9 number 1. To this query, the Aristook answered, What is your course and are you trying to find us? To this message, there was no answer. The Aristook, after an all-night vigil, was ordered to launch a plane at daylight to aid in the search. The work last night was hampered off the east coast of the island of Maui by treacherous seas and heavy skies. On account of this condition, three planes which took off from Lahaina to aid in the search were ordered to return and wait until dawn before going into the air again. The PN-9 No. 1, with her sister seaplane, the PN-9 No. 3, left San Francisco Monday afternoon on a scheduled non-stop flight to Pearl Harbor, Oahu. The number three plane gave up some 300 miles outside the Golden Gate because of mechanical difficulties. The number one machine, flag plane of the flight, scurried on. The destroyer, William Jones, was reported by the Marine Department of the Chamber of Commerce entering the Golden Gate at 7.05 a.m. with an airplane in tow. The plane towed in was the PN-9 No. 3, which gave up the non-stop flight endeavor and was forced down about 300 miles out on the route from San Francisco to Honolulu on account of oil pressure feed trouble affecting both engines. Ten ships of the United States Navy have been past definite positions on the line of the flight. Ship after ship was passed, even the USS Langley, the halfway point in the flight, an attainment of the Pearl Harbor objective was only a matter of hours. Rising winds, however, retarded the speed of the ship and forced extra vigilant use of the carefully rationed store of gasoline, the food of the engines. Tuesday, shortly after noon in Honolulu, 
Commander Rogers radioed that his fuel was running low. Two hours more, and after a number of messages saying it would be forced to alight, the seaplane's radio was silenced. Rain was falling steadily in the vicinity of the seaplane. Visibility was bad. The ships which started out to rescue the stranded aviators found themselves hampered by the encroaching night and by lack of definite bearings showing the location of the lost plane. Navy officers were confident that Commander Rogers would do everything possible to save his ship and his four men, although he admitted anxiety over weather conditions. September 11, 1925. All of Kauai turned out early today to witness the ending of an epic of the air and sea, and the ending was as dramatic as the rescue of Commander John Rogers and his crew of four on board the missing PN-9 plane. Provisioned by the rescuing submarine R-4, Commander Rogers and his crew elected to finish their voyage as they had started it, in their plane. Towed to a point off Nowilly Willy Harbor, small launches attempted to take the lines from the submarine, and the plane broke loose and started to drift ashore. Commander Rogers and his men still refused to be taken off and endeavored to navigate their plane to the inner harbor and anchor it. A Hawaiian swimmer hastened to swim to the drifting seaplane to warn Commander Rogers he was in a dangerous place. All right, tow us ashore, he told him. Lines were then attached again and the plane towed to the beach, but Commander Rogers and his men remained aboard until the beach was reached. Did the PN-9 number three make the hop? These were the first words of Commander Rogers as he and his men stepped from the seaplane on which they were lost for nine days on the Pacific. Wearing nine days worth of beard and pale from hunger and exposure, cold nerve Rogers and the four men who made up the crew landed at Lihu earlier today, but the cool daring and the sheer nerve which carried them through one of the most thrilling episodes in the history of aviation rode with them into the harbor on the PN-9. The heroic example, unfailing cheerfulness, resourcefulness, and navigating ability of Commander Cold Nerve John Rogers brought the PN-9 number one seaplane and its crew of four safe to land. This is easy, boys, Commander Rogers told his men. Why, I know a man who floated 15 days on a log, he cheered them. Commander Rogers was confident at all times that the plane would reach Kauai unassisted. The flight leader sustained a broken finger, the only casualty of the expedition. Commander Rogers had a hot bath as soon as he reached the hotel and refused to go to bed immediately. I don't want to go to bed, Commander Rogers told the doctor attending him. I want to stay up and enjoy life. Commander Rogers estimated that his plane landed 200 miles north of the Aristook. The chief rations of the five men aboard the powerless plane for the first four days was corn willy, their reserve food. Food gave out on the fifth day of their wanderings, Rogers said today. They had water, however, due to the complete equipment of the plane. Fabric was used to fashion a reservoir in which rainwater was caught. A small still on board the seaplane was also used to distill seawater. The landing on September 1st, when the plane passed out of sight, was made without difficulty, Commander Rogers declared. The plane came down north of the guard ship Aristook, the last vessel to be in communication with the plane. On the third day after the big plane had gone adrift, it passed through a heavy storm, but weathered the blow gallantly. Otherwise, practically fair and calm weather was experienced, Roger said. The hull of the plane was practically intact when she rode into Nowilly Willy Harbor in tow of the submarine R-4. Her wings, however, were badly smashed. When the question of returning to Pearl Harbor, Honolulu, 110 miles distant, was broached, Commander Rogers proposed riding there on his plane in tow of a destroyer. Officials, however, are expected to veto that plan, and the rescued birdman will probably arrive late today in Honolulu on a destroyer. The PN-9 kept its radio receiving apparatus working during the entire nine days that the plane was adrift on the trackless water of the Pacific. They heard all of the messages that passed through the air while the frantic search was being conducted. These messages cheered the flyers greatly and helped them pass the weary days. 
The flyers were in a position to watch the hunt for their plane from a silent sideline. At no time did we give up hope, Commander Rogers declared. We heard the famous message of the Aristook. Don't give up, John. We'll get you yet. About the second day, the derelict plane sighted a steamer and waved frantically but failed to attract its attention. The first act of Commander Rogers on stepping ashore was to send messages to his own parents and those of all of the crew telling them of the crew's safety. When Rogers and the crew came ashore, a huge crowd greeted them. They were immediately taken to a hotel where a doctor examined them. Then they were put to bed to rest up from their nine days of deprivation. True to naval traditions, Commander Rogers was the last to leave the plane and come ashore. All of the flyers made light of their experiences, but their badly sunburned and wind-blistered faces told the tale of their suffering. Commander Rogers' lips were badly chapped. Catching showers saved our lives, Commander Rogers said. Our plane drifted northwest, the flight commander said. No searching ships or airplanes were sighted until Tuesday. When off the coast of Kehu, we sighted two searching airplanes flying near our derelict plane. Then came the second heartbreaking disappointment. We attempted to signal them, but were unsuccessful. They passed on, said Rogers. Then we rigged a sail and decided to make for the island of Oahu. We sighted that island Tuesday, but the wind changed, bearing us northward. The PN-9 then tried to make for Ahukini, Maui, but would probably have drifted past the island if they had not been picked up by the R-4 late yesterday. Once on Thursday, the derelict seaplane saw an airplane heading directly for them. Their hopes of rescue surged high, but the searching plane failed to see them. It turned at a right angle and flew away, and once more their hopes were dashed. The messages passing through the air that we were able to pick up concerning the search kept us cheered up, added Rogers, at least till we heard one saying that it was advisable to give up the search. That was not so good. The steamer sighted the second day, the man of the plane believed to be the Kalawai, passenger and freight vessel plying between San Francisco and Honolulu. There wasn't enough wind to get power from the propeller generator, Commander Rogers stated in explaining why they were unable to use their radio to notify searching vessels of their position. So we took the engine apart and tried to use the starter for power. We tried three different radio hookups, but none worked. We used flares only when we thought they would be of some use off the island of Oahu and when we sighted the steamer. Our drift was south and southwest. The PN-9 proved seaworthy, Commander Rogers said. The men on board the plane received their first food in four days when provisions were sent aboard by the R-4 as soon as she had made a line fast to the PN-9 number one. The aviators were in good condition and the plane appeared little the worse for its long flight and long sea voyage. The submarine towing the plane reached the harbor shortly after 8 p.m. last night. The USS Colorado of the Pacific Fleet is proceeding here and Commander Rogers and his men probably will be taken aboard this warship for their 110-mile trip to Honolulu. The R-4, which had been searching Kauai Channel, sighted the missing plane at 4.15 yesterday afternoon, almost nine days to the hour from the time that the PN-9 No. 1's radio sputtered out its last message, gas getting low, keep close track of the plane. The point at which the plane was found had been searched and researched. Naval experts had figured that the missing plane might drift through the Kauai Channel, which separates the islands of Kauai and Oahu, but their calculations had placed the plane there days ago. When news of the flyers had been found reached Honolulu at dusk, it spread like wildfire through the city. Men, women, and children ran from houses to spread the glad tidings. Scarcely believing ears heard it, and the first question on all lips was, Are they alive? Assured that they were, the people poured out to celebrate the news. Newspaper extras were snatched from the newsies. Throughout the night, hundreds of congratulatory messages poured in from the United States. Naval headquarters at Honolulu was raised from the depths of gloom to the heights of happiness. Couched in naval phraseology, the glad news was flashed to Flight Project Commander Stanford Moses in San Francisco and to the Secretary of the Navy Wilbur in Washington. Lieutenant Osborne, commanding the submarine which found the drifting seaplane while searching the remote inlands of the extensive Hawaiian group of islands, 
told him laconic radiograms of the discovery, which ended ten days of despairing search. The first message stated that the flyers and crew had been found. A later report requested a tug sent to Noilly Willie for Rogers and his men who were in good health. Although the search of many destroyers, minesweepers, and submarines was continuing through the remote sea stretches into which it was thought the PN-9 No. 1 might have drifted, hope for their return had practically been given up. Attention to the isolated waters where the R-4 found the men and their plane was first called by the minesweeper Whippoorwill, which reported seeing rockets in that direction when the search was but two days old. The PN-9 No. 1 had drifted nearly 350 miles since a shortage of gasoline compelled it to alight. I am the happiest man in the world. Those were the words today of Captain Stanford E. Moses, Hawaiian Flight Project Commander, as news of the miraculous rescue of Commander John Rogers and his four men of the PN-9 No. 1 continued to reach him. The PN-9 No. 1 was lost exactly nine days ago. I sent the men out, and next to the parents of the men themselves, I have been most anxious for their safe return, Captain Moses said. Their finding bears out the hopes that we reluctantly gave up a few days ago. We then believed that Rogers and his men would pull through. Captain Moses announced that the finding of the PN-9 No. 1 would make no change in plans for the PB-1. The PB-1 cannot take off in any event before completing her test flight, the officer said, and things are so unsettled now that it will be impossible to say what will be ordered. Captain John Strong, intrepid aviator of the PB-1, was happy over the rescue of his comrades. Great stuff, he said. That clears the air, and I believe it will mean that the PB-1 will now be given a chance to make the flight to Hawaii. Rear Admiral John A. Rogers, USN, retired, father of Commander John Rogers of the seaplane PN-9 No. 1, had about decided that he would never hear from his son again when word reached him early today through the Navy Department that he had been picked up in the Pacific. Veteran of many years on the sea, Admiral Rogers was familiar with conditions in the Pacific and knew what his son and his companions would have to contend with after they were forced down. Other members of the Rogers family had continued to be more optimistic, however. Commander Rogers is regarded as one of the Navy's leading aviation experts and one of its most experienced flyers. Commander Rogers and crew resting well with me. His men praise his ability as a navigator. Plane anchored at Nawili Willie. This message, signed by Sheriff Rice of Lihu, Island of Kauai, was received today by Captain Stanford Moses, Flight Project Commander. Sheriff Rice is an old friend of Captain Moses. They're in fine hands, he said. As a reward for the heroic manner in which he overcame the great difficulties in his flight from San Francisco to Honolulu, Commander John Rogers of the seaplane PN-9 No. 1 was today promoted to the post of Assistant Chief of the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics. Commander Rogers is a member of a family who have been famous in naval circles since the Revolutionary War. The Navy Department, shortly after Rogers' promotion was announced, issued the following statement detailing his naval career. Commander Rogers was among the first group of naval officers to receive aviation training. In March 1911, he was ordered to Dayton, Ohio, where he received aviation instruction from the Wright brothers. Following this first period of aviation instruction, he came to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, where the pioneer officers in naval aviation were assembled into the first Naval Aviation Department. Commander Rogers was the senior officer of this group. This was in August 1911. While on this duty, Commander Rogers made the first cross-country flight made by a naval officer and one of the first cross-country flights ever made in this country. The plane, a Wright Brothers machine, was assembled at Washington, flown then to Baltimore, and back to Annapolis. During the winter of 1911 and 1912, Commander Rogers assisted his cousin, C.P. Rogers, in making the first cross-continent flight made in this country. Commander Rogers accompanied his cousin on a number of the sections of this flight. In January 1912, he went to San Diego, California, where with other pioneer naval aviation officers, 
he established a naval aviation station. He was the senior officer of this group. While at San Diego, he conducted original valuable and interesting experiments with seaplane floats. For this reason, it may be said that he was a pioneer in placing aviation in the Navy at sea with the fleet. In May 1913, he returned to Annapolis, where he was still the senior officer among the aviation officers present and continued his developments and experiments in naval aviation. In August 1913, he returned to general service in the Navy, not aviation. During the period he was not actively in naval aviation, he continued his interest in flying and made flights at the Naval Air Station in Florida. In July 1922, Commander Rogers returned to naval aviation, taking command of the air station at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. He remained in command of the station until the completion of the joint Army and Navy maneuvers around Hawaii last spring, when he left Pearl Harbor to take command of the USS Wright aircraft tender with the aircraft squadrons of the scouting fleet. While on this duty, he was selected for duty as commanding officer of the West Coast Hawaii Flight Unit. The PN-9 No. 1 was headline news and was covered in countless newspapers. It also went missing at the same time the Shenandoah crashed. The main newspapers used for this article are the Bismarck Tribune, September 2, 1925, the Washington Times, September 11, 1925, and the Seward Daily Gateway, September 11, 1925. This is a Country Road production because history is fascinating.